My name is Greg Sterling. I serve as the Dean of Yale Divinity School. Twice a year, we collaborate with Yale clubs in select cities throughout the US to sponsor a panel that discusses an issue of national importance, but that is particularly pertinent to the city in which we hold the discussion. I don't think that we could have timed this panel discussion much better uh, than tonight after the events of last week and then again today. You may be wondering, why would a divinity school initiate such discussions? There are two major reasons. The first is that while immigration has many dimensions and facets, one perspective that should not be overlooked is the moral issue that underlies the political discussion. Immigration is not only an issue for politicians and human rights activists, it is certainly that. It is a moral issue. For those of us who take the biblical text seriously and who recognize that the Hebrew Bible championed the rights of the stranger, that is somebody who was not a citizen in their midst, and that Jesus of Nazareth was a supporter of the marginal and the underrepresented of his day, it is imperative that we consider carefully how we treat people in desperate circumstances. It is a moral issue because in the biblical story, the Hebrew people were refugees from Egypt and exiles from their own land. And because some early Christians were not only metaphorically resident aliens, but were literally resident aliens. There is a need to be clear about the moral implications of the political debate. Secondly, as a dean of a school in a major American research university, I'm deeply concerned about this issue. You're going to think this is a line, but I believe this, and I think it will actually be substantiated. One of the major contributions of the United States of America in the 20th century will eventually be recognized as our higher educational system. We have trained more people globally than any other country in the world. If we surrender our leadership role, the surrender will not only have an impact on universities and colleges, but on the companies that employ the graduates of those schools. These are our major motives, but there are others as well. The issues and concerns are broad, which is why those who have worked to put this panel together and the panelists themselves are from a wide range of backgrounds. And I'd like just to recognize the people who spent a good number of hours to facilitate this event tonight. So as I call your name, not everyone can be here, but would you stand and when everyone is standing, then we'll recognize them with a round of applause. First, to the staff of All Saints Episcopal Church here, who are our hosts, especially to Reverend Mike Hinman, who I know can't be here tonight, the rector, to Christina Honchel, the parish administrator, to Debbie Daniels, the event administrator, and Keith Holman, the director of communications. And I also want to add a special word of thanks to Reverend Steve Huber, from, who is the rector of All Saints Episcopal Church in Beverly Hills, Steve, stand up, uh, who has been heavily involved in planning this. Two members of the Yale Alumni Association have devoted a good deal of time to this event, Mickey Dobbs and Nori Babbitt, and they are here, we're maybe in, in the back. Okay, thank you both. And a number of the staff from Yale Divinity School 
have worked and spent a large number of hours. Gail Briggs, especially, Director of Alumni Affairs. Tom Krattenmaker, Gail stand up. Tom Krattenmaker, Director of Communications. Jim Hackney, the Senior Director of Development. And somebody I want to recognize, Dax Crocker, a student at the school who's done more to support immigrants than any other student presently at the school and has joined us tonight for this event. Would you join me in thanking them for all of the time they've spent putting this together? I also want to recognize uh, each of you for your time. I know it's not easy to get here at this hour of the day uh, in LA traffic. Uh, we thank you and a special word of thanks to Mark Ridley Thomas, a county supervisor who went to the trouble of joining us tonight and being a part of our audience. We are very fortunate to have an exceptionally talented moderator this evening, Professor Steve Pitty of Yale University, a colleague. Professor Pitty received his bachelor's degree from Yale and his master's and doctorate from a school in Palo Alto that is someone who went to Berkeley. I find it very difficult to pronounce that name. <laughs> but if I try real hard, I can say that after he completed his program at Stanford, uh, he did a postdoc at UC San Diego, then came to Yale where he ascended through the faculty ranks very quickly until he became and now is Professor of History and American Studies. He is also the head of Ezra Stiles College. Those of you with Yale connections know what that means. And the founding director and current director of the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. His major books include The Devil in the Silicon Valley, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in Northern California, 2003. American Latinos in the Making of the United States, 2012. And one of his current projects is, is tentatively entitled The World of Cesar Chavez. Professor Pitty is no stranger to the issues of immigration, nor is he a stranger to the particular issues in California. Would you please join me in welcoming our moderator? Uh, thank you so much, Dean Sterling. It really is an honor to be here with you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the leadership of others in uh, the Yale Divinity School that has played such an important role for so long um, in the broader leadership um, in uh, churches and other faith communities in this country and abroad, and indeed in the national culture of the United States. Uh, I'm grateful that you've taken um, a leadership role here tonight and in other events to help us to clarify the issues and challenges before us uh, related to uh, migration and immigration. I also wanna thank our hosts at All Saints Episcopal Church. It's, it's wonderful, it's really an honor to be here in this beautiful space and to be dignified um, by, uh, by this place and by your presence. It's wonderful to look out on the audience and see uh, both old friends and new friends and to know that we're gonna have a very important, uh, very exciting conversation uh, this evening. Um, I want to introduce uh, our panelists um, and then ask them to speak. I will uh, address a few questions to our panel, um, and then we will open this up for question and answer, at, at which time we hope that all of you present will uh, join us at the microphone and ask a question to one or more of our panelists. Uh, if possible, we'd ask you at that to, to, when, it's, when it is Q&A time um, to direct your question to one particular panelist or perhaps two so that we can get through as many questions and answers as we can. Uh, uh, to my far left is Apolonio Pol Polo Morales, the political director for the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles. Polo attended the University of California at Berkeley and then worked for the California Nurses Association, United Steelworkers, Healthcare Workers Alliance. He is the former PICO National Network Immigration Lead Organizer, 
where he helped in that capacity to strengthen immigrant organizing across various faith institutions with the campaign for citizenship. To his right is my colleague uh, on the Yale faculty, Professor Lamin Sane. Lamin is the D. Willis James Professor of Missions and World Christianity at Yale Divinity School and Professor of History at Yale University. Born in the Gambia, Professor Sane is a prolific scholar who's authored more than 200 scholarly articles on religious and historical subjects. He's also written more than a dozen books, including most recently Beyond Jihad, which explores the pacifist tradition in Islam. To his right, Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Felicia is a policymaker and coalition builder with vast experience in the government and nonprofit sectors. Most recently, she served as special assistant to President Obama for immigration policy. Currently, Felicia is the principal consultant for the LA Justice Fund, a public-private partnership that seeks to increase access to legal services for immigrants in removal proceedings. Felicia is also a member of the American Bar Association's Commission on Immigration. And finally, to my immediate left, Isaac Cuevas. Isaac is the Associate Director of Immigration Affairs for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. In that role, he serves as the voice for the Archdiocese among policy leaders. The son of an undocumented immigrant, Isaac is currently developing a network of community leaders and resources for people seeking help on issues related to immigration law. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Before I ask my first question for the panel, I want also to acknowledge, if she's here, Andrea Moreno, who I know was uh, intending to come on behalf of uh, Commissioner Hilda Solis. Uh, uh, Ms. Moreno is the field deputy in the San Gabriel Valley um, for Commissioner uh, Hilda Solis. Uh, if you are here, Ms. Moreno, would you identify yourself? She may still be on her way. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna, as I said, ask a few questions of our panelists in advance of having a conversation with all of you. And I thought I would open, if I might, um, perhaps beginning with you, Polo, and then proceeding down the table, um, by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your recent work, about your motivation for doing that work, and about what in particular uh, of interest brings you to this panel today. Polo, would you mind starting, please? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of what we're working on, or I'm working on, I should say, um, with a whole host of other organizations and building coalition is to really address the uh, rescinding of the DACA program, which was an Obama-era program, um, which helped about 800,000 undocumented youth step out of the shadows, 223,000 of which live here in California. So for me, um, this is a very close and personal issue to me. My mom, you know, you can say is one of the original dreamers. Uh, she came here as an undocumented immigrant in the early 70s, following in my grandfather's footsteps, who was also a bracero in, in the 60s. So it's a long history of migration um, that we have here in California, and really where we're at at this moment in time as the issue of immigration has become such a hot button issue, uh, an issue that it needs to be resolved. Um, there's a myriad ways of resolving the issue of immigration in our country, but really looking at the opportunities that are afforded right now to be able to address the undocumented folks that just lost their status or about to lose their status in March is to find that permanent solution. So for me, being involved in this issue of immigration is something that I've dedicated my life to, to try to understand fully, to try to find that moral compass around it, to lift up you know, the best of, of what we have to offer as a country of immigrants and really trying to echo that for the future as well. Um. Um, I um, just finished a book recently on the history of pacifism in a tradition in West African Islam, which is not very well known, but the tradition goes back a thousand years 
And what I try to do in the book is to show the historical connection between migration, uh, these people, clerics, communities, um, have a specialty uh, of moving uh, en masse from one place to another to preserve their pacifist principles. And that's led me to appreciate, I think, the importance of, of frontier, of being on the margins, uh, and how some of the most important changes that have happened culturally and historically have been as a result of this experience of the margin. Um, and this form of marginality is a kind of moral um, uh, marginality based on conviction um, that the majority of people are usually quite content and uh, almost nonchalant and cavalier uh, about certain values they take for granted. But people on the move, on the other hand, cannot take those values and ideas for granted. Uh, and in doing, approaching uh, values and cultures and societies from that point of view, gives them a particular angle um, that helps to challenge those values and in challenging those values to transform them. And in the process, change our view of the world uh, as well. So that work has led me uh, to a project that I'm mulling over now in my own mind about the role of religion uh, as a building block of civil society that actually helps to strengthen a tradition and a culture of pluralism uh, and diversity. Uh, and that when that happens, uh, it seems to me that the whole of society benefits from that. And if I may end on an anecdote, uh, I was recently, a year or so ago, at the Library of Congress um, when the librarian, James Billington, was retiring. And one of the stories told about why we have a Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., was the resolve of Congress to say that um, Greece must come to Rome. Uh, that is to say that uh, the world of learning, of philosophy, and literature must come to the center of power. And I think you can expand that by saying, well, that is also true about America. Um, that America um, is most itself when it draws on the cultures of others. And that you can't really play a role in the world without that uh, being made available. Um, so the Library of Congress, for me, is an illustration of the fact that, as people have said about Rome, Rome was never more itself than when it borrowed from the Greeks. And America is never more itself than when it borrows and leans and depends on the cultures of the world. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. Thanks to Dean Sterling uh, for organizing this event. When I was an undergrad about 20 years or so ago at Yale, um, these were not the kinds of events you, you would have on Yale campus uh, to talk about issues related to immigration. So uh, I really appreciate you bringing this conversation to the alums and to, uh, to, to Los Angeles as well and the work that you're doing on campus to help support these issues. Uh, I'd also have to, uh, would be remiss if I didn't also thank Steve Pitty for the work that he's doing. He was my uh, senior advisor at Yale. I was one of his first uh, uh, seniors that he advised um, uh, on my senior thesis. And to see the work that he's been doing uh, with the ethnicity, race, and migration major, uh, but also the new center, uh, is really amazing. And I'm glad that he was able to come out to LA um, to join us for this event, but to also talk to alumni about the work that he's doing at the Center on the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. So my name is Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Um, I, um, I recently mo moved back to Los Angeles after spending 13 years in Washington, D.C., where I worked both in the United States Senate and then for eight years, uh, in the, or for seven and a half years in the, in the Obama administration. Um, I've spent um, 
really since I graduated from Yale, my entire professional career working on immigration policy at the state and local level at first, but then uh, at the federal level. And I have to say that I got very involved in this issue as a young person in high school and in college around the time of one of the last waves of anti-immigrant sentiment. So um, when California was passing Prop 187, uh, Prop 209, Prop, uh, Prop 227, I was actually living in San Antonio, which is where I'm from, um, and watching what was happening in California and, and, hope, and standing in solidarity with uh, Latino communities in California, um, in, in Texas, and then beyond when I was in college. Um, and, you know, to see that we're at this moment again, um, you know, is unfortunate. Um, it's uh, a part of our nation's history. Um, and, you know, we've had these waves of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, it's been a very long time since uh, the person at the, at, with the largest bully pulpit, elected official with the largest bully pulpit, has also shared in being openly hostile to immigrants and refugees in the way that we've seen, that we see right now. Um, and so that is hard to witness. Um, you know, the work that I did in the Obama administration to try to make the system work better in the confines of a broken law, um, you know, to see that, that work get dismantled is really disheartening. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the questions I think, Steve, you had asked was kind of how you keep going in this very difficult time. Um, you know, I think for me, I always try to look, keep it in perspective because for me, you know, I've had incredible privileges to go to amazing institutions like Yale and to work at the highest levels of government um, and representing my community um, on issues like immigration. And so, you know, for people, for me to complain about the privileges that I've had, I've had when there are so many people right now living in fear um, about what the next action is for this administration. You know, as Polo mentioned, 800,000 dreamers, including, you know, one out of four that live in California. Um, it, it puts it all in perspective in terms of kind of, you know, how, who am I to complain uh, when there's so many people who are suffering right now. Um, so the work that I'm doing right now since I moved back to Los Angeles uh, has really been around trying to give people who, who do get ensnared in the immigration enforcement system and uh, right now pretty much anyone is an enforcement priority under this administration and could get picked up and removed and um, including DACA people with DACA even before um, the the latest actions that were taken to terminate the program um, and you know when when people are in those situations they need they need help they need lawyers um, there are plenty of studies that show that if you have a lawyer when you go before a judge an immigration court judge your chances of actually getting relief go up exponentially. Uh, your if, you're, if you're detained, your chances of actually being released from detention while your case is proceeding go up exponentially. And so um, the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, and two foundations um, that, I, that I work with as a consultant, the Weingart Foundation and the California Community Fo Foundation teamed up um, pretty early this year to announce the creation of the LA Justice Fund. Uh, we are going in the next few weeks to give out um, $7 million um, to uh, legal services providers here in the Los Angeles County area that um, are already have experience doing removal defense, um, helping immigrants in deportation proceedings uh, make their case uh, before a judge. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, ensure that those, you know, as many of those people as possible can get relief um, from, from removal. Um, you know, I think that the program, the state is also chipping in um, about, about, about $30 million. Some of that money is going to citizenship and some of that money is also going to removal defense. Um, and there are other foundations that are also interested, I think, in supporting this work. But um, I really have to thank the leadership of the, of the city and the county and the foundations that I now work for. Um, but also uh, the immigrant advocates um, like uh, Bolo's organization for really standing up uh, for folks um, in the middle of um, what was really difficult, a situation and challenging times when people were concerned about what was coming once um, you know, the new president was elected um, for coming up with some concrete solutions to, to give people tools um, to, to help them through this very difficult process. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to be back in Los Angeles. I came to law school here and my husband is from here. Um, it's, you know, I miss DC, but I know that this is where, um, in, in, in states and localities, is where really the good work is happening. Unfortunately, it's not happening in Congress and at the federal level to help support immigrants. And so it's great to be a part of that work now. Hello. Can you hear me? Now you can hear me. 
Hello, my name is Isaac Cuevas, and uh, as Stephen mentioned, I am the Associate Director for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and the new Office of Immigration Affairs. And I have to admit, I'm, I feel like I'm probably the worst student up here on this panel, so, because I, I totally forgot what the questions were. <laughs> the question was <laughs> to tell us a little, a little bit, bit about, about the work, work right, 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 and, right. and your motivation for doing that work and uh, what in the work that you're doing Got it, got Made it. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, um, again, uh, Isaac Cuevas, Office of Immigration Affairs, we covered that. Uh, a little bit about the work. Uh, right now, my job is focused in really two areas. One, developing the resources and the tools and the networks to establish and disseminate information for the immigrant community that needs it the most. Um, obviously, people uh, turn to the church for various life issues, and it was important under the leadership of Archbishop Gomez here in Los Angeles Keep in mind, Los Angeles being the diocese with almost five million parishioners and the biggest diocese in the United States. Uh, I, I want to say seventh largest in the world in terms of uh, uh, parishioners. Uh, it was important that we, we set up this office and really uh, develop these uh, outlets for people to know that they can turn to the church for, for this kind of help. So my job really kind of focuses in two areas. One, it's the, that ad, that that job of getting the resources out there, and the other part is advocacy. Uh, the advocacy, though, I think uh, falls into two areas. Uh, the legislative part, which uh, uh, is happening and, and you know, part of the reason why we're here today. But I think the other part, and uh, which is really a, a personal part to me, is uh, the part about uh, being an advocate within our own parishes and within our own people. Making sure that people understand that, uh, for the church at least, immigration is really kind of rooted in the uh, looking at it as a topic of human dignity, first and foremost, and not so much uh, a topic of, of politics. And obviously it, it, it has its politics overlay and the politics will have to figure themselves out uh, in, in somehow, some way. But for me, the beauty about coming to work for the Archdiocese was really being able to utilize my faith and my values and, and ground it into that work and, and to just quickly kind of answer the question of, uh, uh, what keeps me going in, in this space, um, and again, part of the reason why I say I'm, I, I, it's an honor to be here among some amazing people, but uh, on my first week, mind you, I've been with the diocese for a little over a month. My first week on the job, I was at a parish, a very affluent parish, uh, who would uh, organize these workshops with uh, parishes that were uh, uh, lower income, under, underserved, and uh, when I introduced myself and met with uh, one of these parishioners, uh, she asked, uh, so you're, you're, you're new to the diocese, congratulations. Uh, uh, tell me about your background, and I have a background in marketing and communications. And she stopped me and she said, well, wait a minute, wait, you're, so you're not a lawyer? You don't, you don't have uh, immigration experience? And I said, oh, my, my immigration experience, well, my immigration experience is simple. Uh, I came here when I was two. Uh, hand-holding uh, my mom who uh, overstayed her visa. We overstayed our visa, I should say, and uh, we lived here uh, undocumented for many years. I remember serving as a translator during our interview with INS back then when it was still INS. I'm a little old school that way. And, um, and then I remember years later filling out uh, my citizenship application, uh, helping my mom, my uncles, my, my family fill out their citizenship application. So, so my immigrant experience comes from being an immigrant and having uh, uh, lived this journey and, and remembering those conversations my parents had sitting at the dinner table asking, what are we gonna do if one of us doesn't come home one night? And, and that stayed with me for forever and, and a big part of the reason why I'm here. Well, thank you all. And um, both Felicia and Isaac, you both addressed this question, but I'd actually love to turn it also to, um, to both Polo and to Lamin. Uh, and, and, the, and the other two of you can also expand on your answers if you'd be interested in doing that. But, um, you know, we read the paper every day. We know the news of the day, and it's uh, increasingly worrisome. It's also discombobulating and confusing and scary and unnerving. And as you think about the many things that need to be done related to uh, addressing immigration and migration, 
uh, in this country today. Uh, would you agree that it's difficult to stay focused at times? Would you agree that it's difficult to stay hopeful at times? Um, and would you offer us any uh, advice, any suggestions about how to stay focused on, 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 on what needs to be done, how to cut through the confusion of the day, to see bigger picture, and how to remain hopeful in order to be able to be active uh, under the conditions we're living? Yeah, I think first and foremost, don't read every single tweet. That's, <laughs> that helps. Um, yeah, it, it is tough. Um, you know, we have families that are coming up to our doors and, you know, every day trying to figure out, like, you know, it, the future is really uncertain in a way that we haven't even imagined in a long, very long time. We have DACA recipients that are at our door realizing that they have to renew their DACA one last time before October 5th, and their paperwork actually has to be submitted and done by October 3rd because it has to be literally in the lockbox at USCIS in order for them to get that extension for two years and, and protection from deportation. So with that um, kind of concern from the community, there's also a lot of alliances that have been built up. Um, if you were you know, watching the news within the past couple of months, you know there's been quite a number of marches that have happened here in Los Angeles, um, and that's resistance that's coming from California is being echoed locally with those alliances with folks that have not traditionally worked with one, with one another in the past or have, you know, had more of a transactional type of relationship. Now we're entering into this territory of transformative change and transformative understanding and working together, which is to say that that is really what gives me hope and optimism for the future. You know, the immigrant spirit is very alive and well. Folks work very hard to get ahead and find a way and figure things out. But there's also a whole group of folks that are standing up and saying, we're with you. Whether it's the Muslim community, whether it's the LGBT community, um, there's a lot of progressive white organizations that have started it up, all trying to understand the issue of immigration in a deeper level. Uh, but not only are they saying, we're going to be there for you, we're turning around and, in turn saying, we're going to be there for you as well. And that so type of solidarity is really what is at the core of the beauty <laughs> of this uh, confusing and, and terrible time we're living in right now, is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. There is inspiration still. And we're not going to stop. And I think that's what really carries me through every day. I mean, would you like to address the question of staying focused and staying hopeful in these times? Yes, I think um, it's important to remember that America began really as an immigrant nation. Um, that, you know, the images used of early America, uh, a city on a hill, the new Canaan, uh, redeem a nation, errand to the world, et cetera, et cetera. All these, and the idea of the frontier, uh, all these really are themes um, uh, on America as a dynamic uh, nation that, in Jefferson's phrase, um, is really committed to um, extending benevolence um, to all of mankind, as he put it. Uh, that the classical Philosophers did very well in bringing us to appreciate what Jefferson calls tranquility of mind, but that they did not really help America uh, where America needed help most, which was to open itself to the world and to embrace all of mankind. And this theme is repeated again and again through American history, and you see it in Abraham, well, um, I think you see it in George Washington's farewell address. Uh, you see it in uh, Abraham Lincoln, FDR, after the crisis, um, John, John F. Kennedy, um, and so forth and so on. So, and Senator Fulbright at the height of the Vietnam War gave a stirring address to the American Bar Association, which was published in the New York, New, New York Times Magazine, April 1968, you can look it up. Uh, in which he castigated America uh, for not living up to the ideals of America, um, and so forth and so on. So I think there is hope in, in what you might call the idea of America, which is imperishable. Uh, America is a frontier of the, of the human spirit. And if you give that up, it seems to me the light will go out. 
Thank you both. I, I want to pick up on something, Polo, that you um, named explicitly, and that's the question of alliances, political alliances in this moment. I think it's something that several of you know something about. Um, and in, in my view, it's we are living in a moment of political alliances different than anything we've seen in the past. We know that anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-immigrant immigrant hostility, anti-immigrant racism is something we've lived through in past decades, but I don't think we've seen quite the level of alliances, creative alliances, in the past that we're seeing today. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask you, uh, whoever wants to comment on this, to reflect a little bit about how immigrants um, are coming together and bringing other people together in new ways during these times, and how the struggle for immigrant rights is bringing together groups that haven't worked together uh, in substantive ways in the past on behalf of immigrant rights. Any thoughts about that? Anyone? I can answer briefly and I want to give other folks an opportunity, but so here's just an example. Every year we organize May Day with the Los Angeles County Labor Federation um, and we work with other you know, unions and other folks in the immigrant rights organizations. We come together. Um, last year in 2016, we had about 40 organizations that signed up to support and turn out and help organize the May Day March. This year we had 124 organizations that came out, environmental, the Women's March, LGBT, Muslim community, like you name it, everybody wanted to be there. And that, uh, those are the moments in organizing where you like it brings a tear to your eye because it's totally unexpected. And it really goes to show that people want to get involved, people want to do something. They see that there's something terribly wrong um, and they want to change it. And that, that sense of, uh, of having that solidarity with people and being there for them, listening to them, understanding their story, their background, uh, getting to know each other's humanity in a way that we, we took for granted, quite frankly, for many, many years. I've been a part of um, each one of the last uh, three failed immigration reform efforts in the last uh, 11 years, unfortunately, and I feel that like I feel that every time we are not able to get immigration reform done, uh, people um, people go back to their their homes and back to their organizations and they retool and they get smarter and they think about how to build alliances. Um, and you know, I think that we're in that moment right now where the immigrant rights movement is you know, is thriving and is rising to the challenge because they always do, uh, because they have to, because of the people that they're representing and, and, you know, understanding how important this issue is to the community. So I think that, you know, you see organizations really rising to the challenge and rising to the occasion in um, extraordinary ways. I agree with Bolo that there are people who have wanted to maybe, you know, have been on the sidelines, have cared about the issue, but just, you know, they have other things on their plate, right? But when you see the crisis the way it is, um, it really makes people act um, and come forward in ways that they haven't before. Um, so, you know, you see it with the business community that is coming out um, very strongly in support of DACA um, and, and working towards a legislative solution and calling out the termination of the program. You know, we, I have been trying to get the, the business community activated on immigration reform in a real way for my entire professional career. And it can be really difficult because they're risk adverse, right? Um, but when they see something like this happening that is so concerning, they have come forward. Um, and I would say that, you know, it also has to do with people being willing to share their stories. Um, you know, the young undocumented youth who have for the last, you know, many years, but really for the last 10 years, been courageous enough to share their stories um, have resulted, have led to many things happening like DACA. Um, and they've been the proof, DACA is the proof of concept for the fact that immigration reform and giving 10 million people access to an earned path to citizenship will be successful. These young people are, are not wasting the opportunity that they're given, that they've been given for the last five years to actually um, improve their lives and give back to the community, creating jobs, helping people in the healthcare industry, teaching people, being lawyers for people, creating businesses. So, you know, I feel that, you know, that is also something that's really important, people sharing their story. Um, and I would just say one other positive an anecdote is, you know, I'm now working in philanthropy, which is um, a new frontier for me. Um, and, you know, philanthropy as well can sometimes be a little risk adverse, or they can be a little slow. 
Um, and when I was in the administration and we were implementing things, when we were implementing DACA, when we were implementing citizenship or trying to get immigration reform done, we were like, can the philanthropic community just like get to the table and like help us, right? And, and not, not in like six months, but like now. <laughs> and um, you see them actually stepping up. You know, there's an organization called a Grant Makers Concern for Immigrants and Refugees. It's a, a national organization that supports uh, foundations that want to get involved in immigration and, and refugee issues. They've seen a dramatic spike in the number of, people, number of foundations that have joined uh, their organization, organizations that came out of the woodwork because they realized that um, their communities were hurting and they needed to get involved in the action. Um, so, you know, those are just some a few snippets uh, in, in very difficult times of, you know, sectors that I think are stepping up and stepping forward. Uh, let me build on that last comment, um, Felicia, um, to say, you know, you, we've, we've talked a little bit already about the ways in which organizations um, are coming together and which philanthropic groups are coming together in new collectivities. I wonder if you would reflect a little bit in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, when we look back on uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, Will we be telling this, uh, the story of this time as the time of organizations coming together um, in solidarity with immigrants, or will we be talking about this as a time of profound immigrant leadership, of immigrants stepping forward and taking the lead in creating these new coalitions and looking at new ways uh, of transforming organizations and groups and defining coalitions? Can you think a little bit about that out loud for us? Any of you? Oh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I, I can add a little bit on that. I think it's both. Um, you know, the, the reason why we have DACA, as Felicia was talking about, it's because young immigrant uh, folks started coming out and telling their story. And then when America fell in love with them, you know, they, they started understanding, you know, who they are, you know, what they're trying to accomplish in life, what they have accomplished in life, that opened up a lot of space for that. And there's also organizations that have been doing this for many, many years. I mean, Chirla has been around for about 31 years. This is our 31st year in existence. We've learned a few things along the way in organizing with coalitions and different things, tactics, strategy, actions, protests, marches, you name it, we've done it all. Um, and for the groups that are coming up or, you know, they're reaching out to us and asking us, how are you doing this or how did you do that? Um, can we think with you? You know, what has worked in the past? Or how can we work together? It's a, a, a really, um, it's fertile ground for that deeper understanding of community organizing on the one end, uh, advocacy on the other, uh, really getting down to creating that environment where we can all thrive. And I think I, I look you know, down the line because my son, who's, uh, who's nine years old, asked me if we were going to get deported. He's a citizen. I'm a citizen. Um, and I think what's going to happen maybe 15, 20 years from now, what conversation uh, you know, am I going to be having with him? Um, and I like to think that it was a conversation around when people came together, they woke up, and they started doing something about the circumstances that were around them. And this goes for immigrant leaders and organizations and individuals alike. Yeah, I think we're in a very unique time. Um, for sure, uh, the fact that we have digital platforms now that help us communicate and push out information. I know at the diocese we use all of our digital tools extensively. We've, we've kind of been the, the lead in the country in, in this aspect in terms of developing uh, not just a network within our, our parishes, but also at the diocesan level to help push out information. And I think from an organizational standpoint, that does a lot in terms of making sure we can push out messages that are in line again with our values but also that help our community kind of go out there and, and, and showcase what we are teaching in the church and also be able to live that because, again, I think, and it's, it's indicative of this panel that the diversity, the, the, the culture that's coming up now is, is this new generation and the leaders are coming from this. And Isaac, with that in mind, could you, with that in mind, could you say a little bit more um, about the work that you're doing? You said that there's two kind of pillars of the work that you're doing. On the one hand, providing the tools to, um, to disseminate information to people who need it the most um, uh, about immigration and about what they can do and should do at this time. And, and the second uh, pillar that you described was advocacy work, helping people to understand what they can do to be advocates uh, in their own uh, in their own communities for, uh, on behalf of themselves. So in the spirit of understanding immigrants' activism, 
from the perspective of your office and from the work that you're doing, could you talk a little bit more about how, how you encourage, how you instruct, um, how you guide the ad people to advocate on their own behalf? Sure, well, let's start with the, um, the resources and the tools and the network that exist. And, and again, keep in mind, I come from a marketing background, so uh, my entire life has been building databases and lists and targets and, uh, and the church, uh, as big as it is and as fantastic as it is, because they're paying me, uh, and because I believe it, um, it's also the church. And a lot of people that work with the church are there on a volunteer basis or uh, uh, may not be as organized or as uh, uh, understanding of the importance of setting up these kind of platforms and these kind of uh, tools to be able to measure and to be able to understand what kind of an impact we're making. So that's a big part of what our office is doing now, making sure that we implement uh, uh, data capture and that we're measuring and that we're, we're getting analytical with the kind of tools and resources and, and the things that we're assisting with so that that way, when it now comes over to the uh, advocacy part, we can have that conversation with legislators and say, look, this is, this is what the uh, population looks like. This is where they're coming from. Uh, these are averages of communities, of groups, of incomes, you name it. And now having that kind of information and that kind of data to back it up, it's not just the emotional part of what we want to uh, convey, which the church is great at, but it really truly is the, the, the numbers and, and showcasing the work that we're doing. Let me pivot a little bit here, um, since we're talking about religiosity, um, to ask you all to think a little bit about not just the intersection of religiosity and faith communities with activism on behalf of immigrants, but also how questions around religion, questions around faith, in some cases seem to have driven anti-immigrant sentiment, concern about immigrants uh, in the modern United States. We think about this often, for example, in the aftermath of 9-11 since 2001, the ways in which concerns about Muslims in the United States hostilities towards Muslims in the United States, the securitization of Islam in the United States has contributed, uh, potentially, um, to concerns more broadly about uh, the dangers of unauthorized uh, migration, so-called, uh, concerns about a so-called open border, uh, concerns about a population living uh, uh, in the shadows. I'd love to hear one or more of you talk a little bit about how you think questions about religion uh, issues of religious tolerance uh, may have contributed in recent years um, to concerns about immigrants and e indeed even hostility towards immigrants. Any thoughts? That's, that's a tough question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I work with the PICO Network for many, many years and I, I organize in different denominations and different churches that we engage with from, you know, from Catholics to Unitarians, to the Jewish synagogues, to the mosques. And what I found everywhere I went is this understanding of, uh, you know, we got some great values that we have to work with. And the goal of our you know, particular religion is to put them into practice and put them into action. And when we talked about values and we talked about aspirations for, you know, immigrant folks, you know, for instance, there was a commonality and understanding that these values are universal values, that they're not particular to one you know, religion, they're not particular to one individual person. These values extend beyond ourselves and, and around the world. And in these conversations, and I had many difficult conversations with folks uh, who at first didn't understand you know, the issue of immigration or they just you know, they heard it on the news or they you know, caught a talking point and they would bring it up and that exception, that idea that the exception is the rule, and how you know, certain news networks will kind of harp on that, that the exception becomes the rule for how things are. And what I learned throughout, because it was a learning process for myself, you know, I didn't know anything about you know, uh, you know, being Muslim, <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about being evangelical. Um, I grew up Catholic. For me, trying to understand where folks were coming from and their, un their anxieties are really tied to other things. Um, and then getting at the core of why they feel that way. Um, it wasn't about the immigrant next door. It was more anxiety in terms of what happened with the collapse of our economy. People lost their jobs, people lost their homes, and there was no moment of, you know, 
taking in uh, the pain and then processing it out, right? It just happened and people's lives were devastated. And it took a long time for folks to bring themselves back up again. And then when I say folks, I mean everybody. Um, people lost their homes in all spectrums across the country. But really finding who to blame, right? Because there wasn't anybody to blame. Um, some politicians took that under their wing and they ran with it. And you know, what happened after 9-11 and really starting to you know, hit this drumbeat of you know, Islamophobia as being, you know, there's some other evil lurking out there that's gonna you know, do something to harm you. And not only that, once we went through the, you know, the economic collapse, you know, there's somebody out there that has it better than you do. This idea that you know, immigrants get everything for free, <laughs> which is an absurd idea, uh, that is something that's been never reconciled. There are no answers for folks. The government does not work for them. The government left them you know, behind. And when you have somebody that provides a simple answer and a simple solution to point the finger and say, that's the person that you should be angry at, and this is the reason why they shouldn't be here, you can understand where they're coming from. And that's not to say there, you know, there is an element of racism in our country. But I believe that the majority of folks that understand, you know, we all have these universal values that we subscribe to or try to understand, uh, most people are some pretty darn good people. <laughs> and that's my, you know, outlook on life. Um, but sitting down, having a conversation, it, it, it opens up a whole other list of things that may be impacting their life. But the simple answer is that person over there. And to make that you know, to make that uh, exception the rule, to take that apart and dismantle it is a process. Um, and I think that's why we're in the situation that we're in right now is like that they weren't able to take it apart and somebody has come along and said, you know, all that anxiety you're feeling, it's justified, the government doesn't work and that's the person you're gonna blame for it. And I think, you know, nobody expected we would be here right now uh, but this is the place that we find ourselves in. And I've found that reaching out across the aisle, having conversations, you might not be able to convince everybody about this issue of immigration and understanding its complexities, uh, but I believe that the dialogue itself and keeping that dialogue open is, is of the utmost importance. Lamin, mean, do you have any thoughts about religious toleration, into, uh, intolerance, and how it may shape or have shaped uh, reactions to immigrants? Yeah, I think 9-11 was, uh, was really a major turning point uh, in images of Islam and radical Islam and the violence uh, that followed 9-11. Uh, Americans asked themselves, I think, fundamentally three questions uh, after 9-11. Um, what have we done? Uh, what have we done to deserve this, this, this hatred, this sort of surge of, of, of intolerance? And the second question they asked themselves was, who are these people? A uh, question of identifying um, and designing a way to, to get our minds around this phenomenon of radical violence. Uh, and the third question was, what can we do about it? What should we do about it? And that last question, what should we do about it, was really answered in the framework of the post-Cold War period. Uh, the tools, the ideas, the strategies we developed in the Cold War, we thought we could adapt and readapt uh, to respond to this phenomenon of radical Islam. Um, and we're still engaged, really, with those questions in a very different way. Um, but I, I would have to say that um, there's a kind of paradox that runs through American history, uh, this extraordinary generosity of Americans, um, and remarkable, I think, degree of religious tolerance. Americans don't like it when you jump on other people's religion. Uh, it's very deep. I mean, when Malcolm X died, the New York Times had an editorial um, which was not exactly, shall I say, complimentary to Malcolm X. Um, but they took great care, uh, and I have a copy of the editorial, uh, they took great care not to blame Islam for Malcolm X's uh, radicalism. 
so Americans have this sort of paradox that um, they are tolerant of religion and don't like to attack anyone's religious tradition. Uh, and the other side of it is uh, we get pretty naive about um, simple ideas, caricatures, stereotypes, uh, pictures in the mind that don't allow us to think through, but merely to use these pictures as a bully rag uh, to wave, and um, we get pretty uh, uncontrollable sometimes. Um, but it was here in California, long before 9-11, that we had a conference uh, of a district of the California Methodist Church, and the pastor, the minister there, was explaining how Muslim immigrants here in California, when they first came, were looking for land to build a mosque. And the church voted, decided in the meeting, to give them a portion of their land uh, to build a mosque. Um, after 9-11, about a week, 10 days after 9-11, I was actually on my way to Fargo uh, to speak to an immigrant community in Fargo. I had no idea Fargo, North Dakota, <laughs> was such a, uh, a center of immigration into the United States. There were 21 different nationalities at the conference. Uh, the man who was checking me in in Minneapolis at the airport, this is on the 21st of September, right? 10 days after 9-11, was a man called Muhammad at the Northwest desk. And I thought to myself, this is remarkable, that in America, you don't have this sort of backlash against anyone carrying the name Muhammad. Uh, and yet here he was working at the airport, checking me in for a flight to Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, so that's the paradox, it seems to me. Um, but the, the early Americans, uh, John Adams, for example, uh, complimented Muhammad uh, as a searcher after the truth, like Socrates. Um, both Jefferson uh, and Madison were equally complimentary of Islam. Um, Jefferson, in fact, studied Islam um, quite a lot, and, and it comes through some of his sentiments. So um, I do think that um, Islam is a very difficult phenomenon today after 9-11 because there are so many pressures building up within the Muslim world itself that are really threatening to tear the Muslim world apart. My, many of my Arab friends, Muslim friends, uh, are completely disenchanted with Islam. Completely disenchanted. Um, and sometimes I find myself trying to persuade them uh, that there is something that Islam can contribute to a culture of tolerance and diversity here in the United States, but they are, they are really torn uh, between what the radicals have reduced the religion to uh, and the political corruption in their own societies and countries, uh, and especially the treatment of women, uh, to whom I felt very close when I was a student in the Middle East. I spent a lot of time talking to Arab women who became some of my best friends. Um, so Islam has a lot of cleaning up to do within the house of Islam. Uh, but I believe that America uh, is probably the most promising, the most auspicious uh, place for Islam to do this rethinking uh, where religious freedom doesn't threaten religion, but actually allows religion to flourish uh, in a very healthy way. Any thoughts from you too? Why don't we now open this up to you all um, for comments and questions. So I would ask um, those of you with questions <clears throat> to please use the microphone here in the center of the room. Um, and if you could, uh, if you have a question directed to one uh, panelist, please uh, make that clear. Uh, we'd ask you to try to keep your questions on the short side and not use the microphone as an opportunity to make a speech of your own. Let's, let, let's hear from the panelists. Thanks. Hey. And why don't you introduce yourself as well? My name is Kevin Winston. I'm a uh, new Yale Board of Governors and also founder of Yale and Hollywood. And uh, my question is, what can people do? 
Um, so I'll start, and Polo, I'm sure, will, and Isaac will have wonderful ideas as well. I mean, I think that um, it's important to stay informed um, about what's going on. There's so much going on, and to actually act on on things that you're concerned about, right? And you know, there are all there are all kinds of ways to act. There are marches and protests that you can go to. Um, you can also uh, work to reach out to your elected officials. Um, you know, I think they need to see people in big numbers at marches, but I think they also, you know, it's equally important to get people to actually, you know, call their members of Congress, meet with staff, um, email them multiple times, uh, because, you know, as someone who worked for a member of Congress, uh, m multiple members of Congress, um, you know, it, it takes persistence and active c civic engagement to actually break through to members, right? They are, they have so much coming at them right now, particularly now that social media exists where, you know, they're getting tens of thousands of emails, a, you know, a month, right? Um, and I think it's it's critical to just always be uh, engaged and continually, in, in continuing to knock on, on their doors. Um, there are also organizations that you can get involved with as well who will help you um, have a sense of what's going on. So, you know, whether it's the Catholic Church, whether it's a business organization, you know, there's many chambers of commerce that are very involved in this issue, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, immigrant rights groups like uh, Polo's organization, um, you know, you don't have to do all the work yourself. Um, you can have people help you, um, you know, stay informed um, and hopefully help give you ideas and tools and tips to, um, to, keep, uh, to keep engaged. Is there a calendar or somewhere that has all the marches? I see a bunch of fly by on Facebook every week, <laughs> but uh, is there a calendar or a central place, or when you say email people, like is there a list of who to email? I'm not, most people don't have the time to do the research to email. Right, right, yeah. So, and so, I mean, so someone's gotta make it simple for people yeah. to engage, because not everyone wants to spend like all their time on this, but if I have an hour over the course of a week, what right. should I be doing? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think there are definitely, um, that's why I said maybe connecting with organizations. I mean, you should definitely be engaging your actual member of Congress. I mean, obviously, the California delegation, particularly the Los Angeles delegation, is in a different place than other members. Um, but they still need to be reminded that this is important, that they need to be fighting for it. But I'll let Bolo and uh, Isaac talk about some of the good tools that they probably have to keep people informed. Yeah, no, follow your social media. Oh. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Now I have to get an Instagram account because you know the kids are moving too fast for me now. Um, no, th there's a lot happening, and I think um, you know we need to be better about letting folks know about it. But you know, just stuff that's on the calendar right now. On October 8th, there's going to be a, a march uh, in downtown Los Angeles. It's against the Muslim travel ban. Um, and the Muslim community is coming together, and we're going out supporting them and gathering at 12 noon. Uh, more information to come. But there are actually, in the next 30 days, a lot of events taking place at congressional district offices. Um, and the push right now is to get the DREAM Act passed. So tomorrow you'll hear more about that, and it'll be all over the news. Um, but there is an effort to make sure that that happens, um, because our window of opportunity is very, very small. Point of, can you guys hear me? There we go. Uh, great recommendations, great ideas, and I like thinking in, in not just macro, but also in micro. And uh, this actually reminds me of a conversation I had recently uh, at one of our parishes at, at a meeting where um, one of our deacons, uh, again, another very affluent parish, really nice parish, uh, out by the beach, and uh, a deacon says, uh, well, we really don't have an an immigration uh, uh, concern at this at this parish, uh, to which I responded, well, it's not so much that you don't have an immigration concern, it's that you haven't thought of incorporating an immigration outreach program into your day-to-day. -day. And that's very different. Um, that's the micro that I'm talking about, where you can actually make a difference, whether it's uh, volunteering to help at, uh, at a workshop to fill out applications, uh, joining somebody, because uh, uh, another thing that we're seeing with our workshops and our meetings is that uh, uh, people sometimes don't want to show up at these workshops because they feel like they're outing themselves. So it's coming along with uh, somebody who may need the services, uh, may need the help because uh, they may want to sit close to somebody who is a citizen so that they can nudge them and say, ask that question for me because I don't want to raise my hand and, and, and put that effort out. So. Uh, uh, definitely to what Felicia and, and Polo mentioned on, on the macro level, but also on the micro level. I mean, each one of us has a community, and I guarantee you that somehow, some way within our community, there's that touch point of, of the immigrant that we're not thinking about. 
for that because this is a Yale event. Uh, there is a group called Yale Strong on Facebook, which I actually created uh, last year uh, at, at Yale, uh, right after the uh, election, when a lot of us were there for assembly two days after the election, I'm like, what do we do? So we created this book, this Facebook group called Yale Strong, so anyone can join that. And basically, people use that to post things that relate to resisting. So uh, anything related to immigration or rallying for a march, that's another place to put it to find other Yaleys who are being active. So it's an, another idea, in addition to the ones that you just suggested. Y'all, I'm really disappointed. This has been a facile conversation. If the premise of this was that there was a, a morality to immigration, the question that hasn't been answered is, why is that moral ground limited to policy change? Why doesn't it include something more radical? Why isn't it regime change? Thank you for the question. Elections come every two and four years. It's probably the short of that. <laughs> um, in terms of other countries or our own, I guess is the question. I feel like, like poor Bolo has fielded all the tough questions tonight. <laughs> um, and, you know, honestly, uh, as a representative of the church, the only thing I can say is, you know, first and foremost, before there's regime change, I think you have to have a little bit of change in your heart. Um, and that goes with everybody. I, I remember being um, uh, the morning that the DACA announcement was made. I was uh, sitting with the, the mayor, uh, Mayor Garcetti has an interfaith group that meets and they just so happened to be meeting that morning and, and the news came down and, and everybody was very emotionally charged and uh, I, again new to the archdiocese I think this was my first time being with this group and uh, as I heard everybody expressing themselves and really kind of that that rage and that angst kind of coming out uh, I, I, I felt how visceral it was and when somebody finally said, who are you and what are you doing here? Um, I introduced myself and, uh, and they were very uh, happy to see me. And I said, you know, I understand where this is all coming from, but I think if we're going to, as, as leaders of the faith community, if we're gonna make a change, it's not gonna come from shaking people and trying to force an issue uh, down anybody's uh, throat. It's gonna come from, um, that leadership example, leading by example, making sure that people understand that, that there's a human element to what this topic is. And until people really understand and know and live that human element, it, it's, it's changing their minds and their hearts first and foremost. I, I'm Steve Huber, a graduate of the Div School, an Episcopal priest. Um, I guess this is for Felicia, but for, for, for others on the panel too. Um, what you've worked on immigration reform policy for many years. What would, you, uh, what would you argue for us would be the main features of an effective, just, compassionate immigration policy that we ought to be advocating for uh, those of us that care about those values. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I, I mean, I, you know, I think that the elements of immigration reform have been, you know, the hard part of this debate is that people who want to change the, the immigration system have kind of known what needs to happen for about 15 years, but we still can't get it through the political process because it always gets in the way. But, you know, that some of the main components, and, and there's also new and emerging components, but you know, some of the main components are um, finding, um, you know, finding a solution for the undocumented folks in our country, finding a way for them to be able to uh, get on a pathway to eventually become citizens um, is the ideal. 
Uh, there's, and that, there's bickering over whether people should just be kicked out, whether they should be able to become citizens or not. Um, and that's a conversation that continues to play out, right? And that's one of the hardest parts of the debate, unfortunately. Even though you know most of the people who are in our country who would benefit from this uh, type of um, you know legalization or earned path to citizenship have been here for 20 plus years at this point, um, so that's one important piece. Um, there is also a need to fix the legal immigration system, and again, people differ on what that means. Um, you know, from my perspective. Uh, I don't think there, there's a lot of talk about um, moving away from the family immigration system um, and, in, and instead focusing more on skills-based immigration. Um, I actually think you don't have to pick, um, you don't have to keep the pie the same. You can grow the pie uh, and you can do a little bit of both. Uh, you can help you know, create a process where people who study here are able to get you know, on a path to a green card and eventually citizenship. People who want to become entrepreneurs can come here and also if they help create businesses, get on a path to a green card and then eventually citizenship. Uh, but you can also continue to make sure that families can get reunited um, with their loved ones from abroad. Um, a lot of people kind of talk about how there's this thing called chain migration and people are bringing their step cousins and you know their fourth or fifth you know you know cousin removed that actually does not happen in the immigration system it, it, there is actually a, um, kind of a hierarchy of the of the types of people that US citizens and green card holders can bring to our country it's a pretty limited pop pot of people but there are certain backlogs in the system right now for certain pops uh, pots of um, people who, uh, who are petitioning to bring their family members here. So you need to clear that backlog, and then you gotta create more avenues for people to come here, because if you allow a skilled immigrant to come here, you know they have families, and one day they're gonna to wanna to bring their families here. You can't just say, we'll just take you, and you can't have your, your wife or your children or your, your partner come as well, right? So there's the legal immigration system. Um, and then increasingly, I think there is a focus on the humanitarian system. So, um, you know, the, uh, the refugee and asylum process, right? It's a very cumbersome process. Um, and it takes sometimes, you know, 20, you know, the average uh, two years ago was about 29 months from someone to move from kind of applying for refugee status and then actually come to our country. You know, I would argue that given the humanitarian crisis in our, in our, you know, across the globe right now, we shouldn't be closing the doors. We should be opening the doors. We've always led on this issue as a country, and we need to, you know, obviously be back at the table. Uh, from my perspective, not everyone obviously agrees with that, right? But there are changes that need to be made to make that system work better. Um, on the kind of uh, you know, on the more conservative side or the kind of the, the right side of the spectrum, there's a lot of people that want to focus more on enforcement. Um, and I think that there is an argument um, that we've been doing that for 20 years. Do we really need to create a border wall, a border wall or do we really need to create um, more, more interior enforcement, right? Um, at the end of the day, whatever gets passed will probably need to be a compromise. So there might be, if it's a big package, not if it's just the DREAM Act, but if it's a big package, there's likely to be something related to enforcement, um, both around the border and interior, but also in work sites. So everyone who applies for a job right now probably knows that they got to fill out a paper I-9 form. Um, that's a pretty, you know, pretty 20th century way to verify people's work set status for the 21st century. Uh, and so there's a desire to make that electronic phased in over time so that we can more accurately make sure that we know who's in the country um, and that they have work authorization. So, I mean, those are the big, those are the four big components. I think there's also been a lot of focus in the last 10 to 12 years on um, integration of immigrants and um, thinking about not just when immig how immigrants get here, but then once they're here, how we help support them um, and how we help support the communities that are welcoming them in um, so that everyone can thrive. And so there's a, there's a lot of focus also on um, whether there could be kind of a, a title of an immigration reform bill that would provide resources to immigrants to learn, to learn English, to gain to help them with the citizenship process and to also help state and local governments um, with kind of the resources of, uh, of serving immigrants uh, and refugees. So to me, those are the big, that's, that's a big package and that's why it's been so hard to get it done because everybody has a different view about how each one of those things needs to happen um, and it will require compromise and not everyone's gonna get what they want if, because that's the way policy making works, unfortunately, but um, with more people advocating for things like, you know, improving our legal immigration system, creating a way for people to, a sane way for people to, to be able to get 
um, uh, you know, earn their citizenship, earn their legalization, um, I think that would go a long way. Wonderful panel. I'm Charlie. I work as a research analyst for Unite Here Local 11. Um, and my question was, uh, uh, how did, I guess, when did the administration decide to, to do DACA? I know that initially there was concerns about whether it would, you know, uh, stand up to constitutional muster. And what, I guess, what are the lessons for activists about how that happened? Uh, and, um, and I guess that's my question. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I can give my perspective, and there's also people from outside of government that have their perspective as well of, of how it all came to be. But, I mean, you know, from the beginning of the administration, you know, I arrived in August of 2009, um, and my first, the, the thing I was told was going to be the first thing I did my first week on the job was work on an immigration reform bill that was going to get to the floor in the fall of 2009 after we passed health care in the summer of 2009. Um, so that obviously didn't happen. It took a, a year longer to pass um, health care. Um, and when we did get health care done, it was such a bloody f fight, unfortunately, that people kind of, people who were willing to talk to us all through 2009 and part of 2010 to work on legislation basically kind of walked away from the table, particularly folks from the Republican side of the aisle, because they said the president already got one major victory. Um, we're not going to give him anything else, right? Uh, and so, you know, in mid-2010, we came to the realization that we needed to do something to, to, to make the system work better. We were already trying, but, like, we needed to do it in a bigger way, um, uh, you know, while we were waiting for our moment in, in Congress to come again, which is a difficult thing, unfortunately, um, to happen uh, at the federal level. So we did a number of different things to try to make the system work better. Frankly, none of them were really working the way we wanted them to. Um, and so in the spring of 2012, uh, we started thinking more seriously about whether we would do deferred action uh, or whether we would create a program for, for DREAMers, um, uh, for undocumented youth. Um, and, you know, it's a really long story. It's actually like a whole nother talk probably. But, um, you know, we were also getting obviously a lot of pressure from the outside community, um, youth, um, immigrant rights organizers, the faith community, lots of people were organizing and pushing us to think about this. Um, and so, I mean, it really all culminated in uh, decisions that were made in, in early, early June um, after kind of we, we did a couple things to make sure that we felt comfortable about this, the decision. One was we had to really think about whether it could legally stand muster because we were certainly afraid that people would challenge it and we might lose. Um, and so that was something that we thought a lot about and worked with uh, lawyers at the Department of Justice uh, to think about that. We also had to make sure that we felt that the agency that would be implementing this actually could do it, right? Because it's one thing to create a policy, it's another thing to implement it. The harder thing, the harder job is actually the implementation side of it. So we spent a lot of time talking to DHS, uh, particularly um, the, the part of DHS that implemented the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services about whether they could really pull this off. Um, and at the same time that we were kind of kicking this around, um, Secretary Napolitano at the time, the Secretary of Homeland Security, also was kicking around ideas, um, and we kind of, you know, it, we all came together um, in early June and made the decision that we were going to move forward. Um, ultimately, the President made the decision with the Secretary. Um, and uh, then we, you know, the announcement was June 15th, 2012. Um, we were given 60 days to implement the policy, uh, which in federal government terms is like nothing. Um, but we had a lot of great um, people within the federal government that believed in the program as well um, that helped us with implementation. So, I mean, that's, that's a very high level um, description of it. But I, I would say that, you know, from the kind of advocacy perspective, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think that the, 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 the young people that were willing and, and unafraid to come out and share their stories had a, a major impact on our decision to do this. Um, and uh, to see that people kept on getting caught up in the immigration enforcement web and system and those people not being afraid to share their stories, um, you know, m made it clear to us that the other things we had been doing weren't doing what, weren't doing the job and weren't, weren't getting the job done in terms of what we wanted. So um, we moved forward and, and implemented DACA. A little bit to that. Um, that was the, kind of the inside. <laughs> From the outside, we heard no a lot, <laughs> a lot 
for a long stretch of time. Um, the, what made the difference after the ACA? There was one election that was lost and the supermajority was gone. Um, there was no way to you know, stop a, the filibuster process there. So when you get to 59, things become less possible even though the will is there. But there was a lot of pressure from the outside and different tactics. I mean, there was marches, sit-ins, there was, uh, you know, writing your letters, uh, you know, talk, standing up to the president when he was in town, um, a lot of different ways. And the way I like to view it is, you know, you know how a pearl is made? It just, with enough pressure over a long stretch of time, it becomes a pearl, right? It's a, it's a consistent type of pressure. Um, and that sometimes is, is necessary. Um, and I, I believe that the only time we've actually ever gotten changed in this country is when there's been persistent uh, pressure, whether it's the Voting Rights Act, whether it was the Civil Rights Era. A lot of changes have come about because people have been persistent and they've put it, they have not stopped in putting that pressure to call to question uh, the, the decisions that are being made or not made, but also to stand on the right side of history. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Yoon Ki Kim. Um, I study uh, at Fuller Theological Seminary. I'm a doctoral student. Um, our family came to the United States 25 years ago. Then 20 years ago, I, we saw our father being deported out of the United States. And later on, I was um, a freshman in high school then, so we couldn't support ourselves. So we eventually had to go back to Korea Two years ago, I came back as an inter international student with F1 visa. Um, and life wasn't easy. When, when you are deported out of the United States, you try very hard to come back. But uh, I mean, I found out as I matured that it wasn't that easy because of all the legal, legal processes and stuff. Um, the, the question that I want to ask today is, um, is more fundamental than the question of what should we do. Uh, the question I want to ask is, what makes people ask that question? What moves people to, to, to put themselves in another situation to help them out, to, to support them? Because when I go to church, I hear people talk about how to support them, but, but then when you are actually at, uh, trying to support them, you don't really have that many people there. So I've always wondered what actually moves human beings to, to, to support another human being in solidarity? What kind of um, epistemology do we have to have? Um, is it our imagination? So this is more of a, a, a fundamental question that I am asking in my research at Fuller. Um, but I just wanted to hear out what you guys thought. Um, and it, it's also related to my experience. So it will be good to, to address that question. If I may. Um, in my opinion, I think it's, it's rooted in cultural context. And what I mean by cultural context, I think, uh, uh, as you mentioned, um, speaking to somebody who maybe doesn't understand what your journey is, what your story is, uh, the background, the, the trials and tribulations, uh, it's been my personal experience that sometimes these people don't understand or don't realize that they may also have a migrant story that they're not aware of. Um, I've heard uh, a, a uh, had a situation before I was working with a diocese uh, where somebody said to me, well, uh, immigrants, those people, our country, you can imagine how this conversation kind of went when uh, I was engaged with this person in, in dialogue and, and I just kind of sat there and, and, and listened and, and, and tried to understand their point of view. And, and when I realized uh, at some point that they had no cultural context in what it meant to have an immigrant story, I turned it around and I asked, um, you know, 
what you're saying right now, the things that you're saying about those people and about not being welcome into your country, there's a really good chance that somewhere down the line in your history, somebody said that to one of your relatives. Once I put it into that kind of context, I could see it sinking in right then and there in that moment. And it's not until people realize that everyone has either an immigrant or a migrant story in some facet, in some way. But until you provide that cultural context of what it means and what that must have felt like for somebody connected to them, they may not understand. So it's important to really kind of, again, live that through, through leadership and through experience and through, and through holding uh, and, and, and walking with that immigrant in that journey to make sure that they feel like they're not alone. Please join me in thanking our panelists and welcoming Dean Sterling back. On all our behalf, thank you for your work and for your time tonight and for your candor and your openness. Uh, I hope that all of us will not let this night pass without resolving in our hearts to do the things that we can and one of the things I heard from this panel is to, to do things we can do locally in our own communities. That is in our power, and I urge you to do it, whether it's a faith community or whether it's just a larger civic community, but be active and do the things that you can do. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>